When buying or selling your home, call Leo Bato. He has years of experience in real estate, showing honesty and integrity in every transaction. He's a person you can definitely trust. So book your appointment with Leo Bato today by giving him a call at 818-648-4837 or by visiting him on the web at www.leobato.realtor. Rejuvenate your smile with Dr. Lourdes Kapalong's comprehensive range of dental solutions. Along with general dentistry, Dr. Kapalong specializes in cosmetic dentistry, including teeth whitening, bonding, dental veneers, and surgical crowns. Whether it's urgent care or preventive treatment, she'll take care of you and your smile. To schedule an appointment, call the clinic at area code 323-257-7582. This episode is brought to you by ABBA eServices. And the podcast will begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ladies and gentlemen, live at Pacos Place, first time. Actually, first podcast. Eh? Jason Fresnedi. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Why does that last name sound so familiar? How come we didn't go by uh, Jason Palomar Fresnedi or... Um, I don't know. I think it's a formality thing. Uh, <laughs> I feel like Jason Fresnetti just being the two names, because legally, as all Filipinos do, you know, you have many, many names, and it's based off, you know, the Catholicism yeah. and the tradition. How many the, names do you have? So I have four. Uh, <laughs> it's Jason Rose Palomar Fresnetti, where Palomar is my mother's yeah. maiden name. Um, and so to go by that is a bit of a mouthful. And so I just stick the ends. Mm. It becomes Jason Fresnetti. Nice. Your mom's not saying anything about that. You know, your mom and dad are competitive, right? Yeah. So as as long as it shows up on the college diploma, on the high school diploma, it's it's all fine. It's all fine. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who don't know, we had our special guests, um, Mr. Georgia Fresnedi and Miss Rodora Palomar Fresnedi. You are the first son, the second son, the third son. What are you? Uh, very important distinction. I'm the only son. Only son, and yeah. you have you have sisters. Yeah. So. Two older sisters. Um, I'm a good bit away from them as well. They're both. They're eight and six years older than I am. So I'm the youngest child and the only son. Okay, youngest child, only son. Pretty much, ten years. You're considered only son, only child. Yeah. yeah. So did it feel that way growing up, like an only child? Um. Only, in, only so much as practical things like. Uh, by the time I was 10 years old, my oldest sister left to college. Mm. Um, and then at 13, we moved and my second sister finished high school, went to college. And so practically, I was an only child in that like <laughs> I lived at home and I was alone. But it's not like my sisters weren't present. You know, right, They still right. called us. They still visited every time they could. And so I saw them and they were a good part of my life growing up. But it was fun being alone in the house with my parents for you know the years that I was in high school and late middle school. Now here, you like like your demeanor, the way you, the way you talk, um, you your your articulate. I want I wanted to find out. So your sister left when you were ten mm -hmm. for college, and practically when you're thirteen or fourteen, your other sister left yeah. for college leaving you alone with mom and dad. Yeah. The, when, when, your, when your eldest sister left, it was like, oh, oh, this is how it's going to be. <laughs> ah. You had a four-year preparation to be only child yeah. and to take advantage of the fact that, oh, it's just me, mom, and dad. <laughs> yeah. What was going through your head? Um, I mean, honestly, you don't, you don't register those things when you're younger. It's more so you see your older <laughs> sister leave and you're a bit excited because then you get to start using her things, you know? You start to you start to get the PlayStation to yourself, and you start to you start to look at her room, and you're like, maybe maybe I can use this right. room for things. Um, and if you're my mom, it's like, oh, maybe I can put my shoes in this room. Uh. But uh, you don't register those things until much much later when it hits you that you know she was the person that took me out to go get food, and she was mm. the person that would walk me to bus stops and bring me home candy if she was out. And so I I did begin. To miss her um, in the years where I was prepping to be quote unquote an only child. Yeah. Uh, but it, it wasn't until my second sister had left and that I was really alone that it, I realized that um, having siblings in the house 
made it a much louder, livelier place than it has. Isn't it, isn't it, uh, you know what you just said is so, that's like a hindsight moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we tend to take our siblings for granted. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Until, until you're the only one eating cereal. <laughs> or when you go home from school, no one's bugging you and it's yeah. quiet. Yeah. Right? And you did you discovered something on the internet and you want to go hey look take a look at yeah yeah that th this like it's just me <laughs> and the sad music in the background <laughs> right yeah those are the things that people that kids tend to forget mm -hmm. and when 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 you realized this did it make you want to reach out to your siblings more or nah um, just deal with it <laughs> Y yes and no. I feel like because our age gaps were so far apart, uh, the emotional range of, you know, reaching out with a sort of intent and with a, a genuine um, outlook and anticipation of seeing them didn't come until I was already doing it myself and I was leaving for college and it was like I, I missed you guys when I was 12, 13, 14 and now I'm 18 and it th doesn't matter. But uh, because at the time it's more like, you know, they get to do their own thing. I get to do my own thing. Yes. And you grow up as your own people. But with that age gap, for my family being so big, um, we really became separate for a few years where it's, you know, I'm coming into my own as a teenager yeah. and then those two have gone off to college. And it was when we were, when I was 18, you know, going to college on my own where we really became friends as siblings um, because we were all technically adults. Adults, yeah. yeah, yeah. Adults. Um, and I feel like that's similar with a lot of, people who have older and younger siblings mm. where you finally meet in the middle right. um, maturity wise and right. in the life stage. So. Now, did, did you guys ever practice the ate, ate, uh, you know, the culture, the Filipino culture? Yeah. Of, this yeah. is ate, this is ate. And, yeah. and you're the youngest, so you don't have any say kind of. Yeah, we did actually. Um, our family, <laughs> uh, my two older sisters, uh, are both very smart. They're very good at what they do and they're very competitive. Um, and so my oldest sister was at the Jesse. And mm -hmm. then after a certain, and my second sister is at the Julian. But after a certain period, you know, only at the Jesse got called at the. And it was because she would look at Julian and look at him and be like, I am at the. And it's because she was at the to Julian and she was at the to me. So to both of us, she's at the, but Julian was only at the to me. And so you get this moment where it's like, well, she's the biggest one. And she was, she was because she's eight years older and right. two years older than my other sister, she was always the biggest one right. when we were growing up. And, you know, she was imposing and she was scary. And so if she tell if she told me like, I'm at there, she's not at there. I'm like, okay. She's, <laughs> I guess she's just Julian. And so to this day, like we still use the honorific. Uh, I call her at there and we both call her at there. And we just right. acknowledge that even if we do call her Julian, it's not a sign of disrespect, but it's yeah, more exactly in the way that Filipino nicknames yes. work, right? It's just a reflection of your yeah. family's dynamic. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a funny story that you tell because of the fact that, you know, your family was weird and quirky growing up. Mm. That's all are. Yeah. Now, when you guys talk, did you find out that when you, when you became an adult, you suddenly had a voice in the, uh, around the family table, like the dinner table, like now, well, no, 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 it's like this. And everybody just stops and listen to your opinion or nah, not you. <laughs> nah, Jason, nah, nah. Uh, I feel like I grew up in a, a very atypical household that way. Um, Explain. Our relationship with our parents has always shocked people when we tell them. And it's because our parents have never really treated us like children or like we were their children, so to speak. Um, their ex it's not like they had no expectations of us, right? You know, expectations exist like in the form of you have to do well in school, you know, you have to try it, what it is uh, you aspire to be. But more in the sense that they never babied us intellectually. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's nice. When it, w when it came to dinner table conversations, if the conversation was, I remember when the recession hit, you know, I was, because this is 2007, 2008, I was barely, what year was I born? I'm barely eight, nine years old. I'm barely, I'm barely eight, nine years old and having to ask them, you know, what's the recession and them not shying away from it. It's like they explained it. They explained what banks were doing, how that came down. And, you know, being able to chip in in whatever way a child can in the sense that, you know, you ask questions like, is that allowed? 
um, as opposed to, you know, is this legal? And obviously that framework grows, but you ask questions like that and they were never afraid to use the terms and the knowledge, the way it was meant to be used in the quote unquote adult world. Right. Um, and so when dinner table conversations happen, uh, everyone kind of has an equal say in what that matter is intellectually. Mm. And then obviously it gets trumped experientially by whatever our parents have lived through. You know, that's nice though. <laughs> it gets trumped experientially. Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's wow. So experience really, well, experience and intellect supersedes pure intellect. I think so. I think the one interesting thing about growing up young and with access to so much information. Don't we all grow up young? <laughs> <laughs> Let me rephrase. That's a good point. That's a really good point. I was I born at a very young age too, you know. <laughs> that's true. Okay, go, go, go. Growing up. I think, I think growing up. In the, in the age of the internet, okay. should I say, um, okay. in the digital age. And growing up with access to so much information yeah. means that young people now tend to come out of their formative years, whether that's like 13, 14, 15, 16, um, very opinionated. And in a good way, it's like these, these kids are reading um, material and substantiating all their facts, all their arguments with facts. On the internet. Yeah, on the internet. Stuff that's available to them. Stuff that is backed by people who have done a lifetime of You know research. how much how much work I had to do and how much <laughs> how much rewriting I had to do when my kids were growing up with the internet? Before it was easy for my parents to say, don't do that because this is what's going to happen if you do that. <laughs> and all we had to do was believe it, right? Yeah. I tried that on my kids. They were looking at me, you know we're going to fact check you, dad, right? <laughs> all the time. All the time. And... You know, my parents and I have butt heads a little bit over the years over this because it's like... Share stories. I want to hear that. Oh, specific examples? I am I mean, it could be as something as simple as, you know, my dad and I both watch basketball together. Ooh. Um, and so it's... I hope you guys are on the same team, no? Yeah, we are. We are. We're, okay, both, okay. we're both huge right now Lakers fans. Oh, so um, I'm so sorry for your loss. But... Uh. <laughs> Yeah, they're not in a good. They're not in a good spot right I now, know. are they? Yeah. As of this um, taping, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, okay, go. So yeah. you, you oh, you're a sports fan, so, you and your dad. Yeah, it's as simple as you know. Um, you're having classic basketball discussions of players in different eras, you know, their impact on the game and what they do, and it's as simple as uh, looking up. You know, how many points did he have in this final series? And it's, you look at things like field goal percentages, you look at points and that information, you know, you'd have to dig up a newspaper for that, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Yes. And now it's like, you look that up and there's a website that hosts that information. Yes. And it's so easily accessible that, um, you know, anytime you're in an argument with someone, it's there and you decide that that fast. And that in a way- I know, right? <laughs> the speed of information, like, unlike before you had to get the sports almanac, buy it in the national bookstore yeah, or whatever. Yeah, and then hope that it's in date. Uh -huh. Oh updated. yeah. Oh my God. Um, and so you grow up with this sense of entitlement to information and a style of argumentation that really lends itself to, you know, pacing. Um, and I think you begin to disagree with other generations because of that. Whereas, you know, you have people that are 40, 50, 60, uh, that have, you know, let's say a career in entertainment, you know, you have a career hosting a podcast. And so you could be, you know, all high and mighty and say, you know, did you know most podcasts see an increase in viewership if they do X? And it's like, you may have 20 years of podcast experience. It's like, well, we tried that and it didn't work. And so even if the data is available and it's there and young people are pointing you and trying to direct you mm. in a fashion that yeah. might seem like is what they know, um, experience still matters. And at dinner table conversations, when you're having uh, that sort of discussion, it's always remember to take into account that, you know, your parents, as old and as grumpy as you think they are, um, they're old and grumpy with a lifetime of wrongdoings yes. and mistakes and learning yes. experiences that they are really trying their best to impart on you. Though, so. You know, you, you, you made up a good point when you said that, you know, like I may be hosting a podcast, I may be the expert at what I do. And if you come to me with data, with data that tells me, hey, Paco, this is what's going to get you to critical mass or blah, blah, blah. And I go, no, this is what we've been doing based on my experience, uh, using that word, based on my experience. The trajectory will be as much 
as X if I do this continuously. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it, number? I have two questions for you. Doesn't it frustrate you that an older guy is using experience based on old um, old results, right? Mm, right. As opposed to you, you may not have the experience or the podcast, but because you've extrapolated the, in, the information using your big data, yeah. you see it and you're trying to help me, but here I am very stubborn to actually listen to you. Does that frustrate you? And number two, does it make you and your generation condescending toward the older generation? It's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. So the first point, uh, does it frustrate me? So insofar as frustration, I feel like frustration in an issue like that is really coming from the side of feeling like you're not heard. Uh. Um, and I think when you, if someone came to you with that data, they've obviously gone through the effort of trying to produce mm, something yes. that will make a difference. And the idea that, yeah, I want to contribute. Uh, this is a project that I'm as passionate as you are about, and this is how I think I can help. And if you turn that down uh, without really revising um, what it means, it is frustrating because it's like, I've done all this work and I've shown it to you and you just turned it away. Um, in that particular example, I think showing data to an older person who then uses experience as that trump card um, is more a misunderstanding and miscommunication of a certain set of values or ideals, right? Because data at its most useful, um, particularly uh, for something like a podcast, is presenting and telling a story. Correct. Um, this idea that, you know, what I'm seeing in front of me is the aggregation of like years worth of episodes and yes. what's popular and what's great. Yes. And so there is a middle ground, I think, where you can present new information with the experience. Um, but obviously that doesn't work if you really believe one way or the other is the right way. And that's how you come to mediums and win-win solutions. Um, the second part of that question doesn't make me condescending. Uh, there are honestly times where I, as someone who grew up in the digital age and has argued like that, have been like, oh my God, I hate the way they do things here. Ah! You know, like I hate that you're using this ridiculous dated database that you can't even search through. Like you have to manually type in your queries. Like why is all the information here? Um, and my parents have always constantly checked me and been like, there are lots of reasons for why a company or a person will use the format that they do. Um, maybe it's saved them in the past. Maybe it's more useful for their particular mm. application. Right. Uh, and it's made me condescending sometimes in that I feel like, you know, this is a newer, better, faster way, but it's also allowed me to reflect a bit in that. Why do I feel this way? Um, and are people's experiences as valuable as what we believe to be the advancement of something. Um, True. Is it something that we should address? And oftentimes I've found myself saying that those experiences can, can be as valuable and that people's, uh, what they bring to the table has a different value to what you bring to the table. And, See, um, that's a nice way of putting it. What people bring to the table has a different or equal value as what you bring to the table. Mm. I just, checked myself with, re- with regard to the hypothetical that I just gave you. The older guy was condescending first. Mm-hmm. You know, based on, based on <laughs> while you were talking, I'm thinking about going, yeah, you're right. I mean, you prepped data, <laughs> right? Your intent was to make his podcast better based on what you had. Yeah. And all you wanted, like the frustration is stemmed from the condescending. At- yeah. Yeah. So it is. It's mean, a vicious cycle. It becomes it, a yeah, vicious a, cycle, right? It's a vicious cycle of, you know, every generation experiences it in the same way that, you know, I'm sure my parents and their parents and my grandparents had things that they did where my parents thought that's so old, you know? Mm. Um, and it's frustrating, but remembering that, you know, being of different generations, I think, is a very important and grounding factor in your relationship with. Yeah. In the workplace and families, et cetera. Your mom and dad, uh, they're very prominent people in the industry. They're like celebrities in a different <laughs> in this in a in a di- in a different industry. So right? I've learned over the years. That's the, that's what I was going to to ask you. So you've learned over the years. Yeah. 
of course, they were mom and dad to you growing up, right? Mm -hmm. When did it become, oh shoot, uh, th that's my dad and that's my mom. I'll, I'll give you context. My son, my eldest son, 26 years old. This episode is brought to you by Leo Bato and Associates. Ang realtor na pato. His, his mom uh, is a famous singer in the Philippines, won tons of awards and all that. My son can't sing. Oh dear. <laughs> But he's popular by name because he's the son of his mom. Yeah. Okay. And um, so I'm a drummer. I think I'm okay. But then again, my son can't. He can play. But he's okay. But he's not me. Mm. And so my son says that, you know, going to a bar where there's a karaoke mm -hmm. or a live band playing <laughs> causes PTSD in me. I'm like out the door right away. I don't want to have anything to do because if they know who I am, well, some of them are going to want to make me sing. I can't sing. <laughs> I'm going to humiliate myself or make me sit down behind the drum kit. I can only play the songs I know. I can't go with the flow and all that stuff. Right. So, And it's caused him stress. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, I'm going to go back like your mom and dad. So you've learned that, oh my God, she is what? And he is what? Yeah. And from him came, plum, 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 plum. And from her came, plum, 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 plum. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Um, Take me through that experience. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, my parents and I, and in particular, I say, my parents and I, because we have yeah. a running joke in our family that the three of us grew up with different parents. Uh, as all parents do. Different stages, right? Yeah, different stages. I feel like, you know, kids grossly underestimate that as you are growing up, your parents are, you know, quote unquote, growing up. Growing up, up. yeah. Growing, growing old. old. Yeah. yeah. And that growing old looks different all the time. Amen. As and sad as it is, it's, you know. Yeah. yeah it's so you're... You know, your son at 26 will have a different set of parents to your daughter at 10. Yes. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It's just the different, way it is. Uh -huh. Yeah. But my parents growing up, I I know that at the very most because they've told me about it. I, I used to idolize my dad. Um, I said I used to tell. Yeah, I was going to say used to. I was going to correct. Uh, no, to this day, I mean, he's still, he's still number one, but I used to, in a way that I used to tell people that I want to be just like dad right. when I grow up. Um, what that meant, I don't know <laughs> because I didn't, and I didn't know anything about his work as, as far as I was concerned, like he, he was a fantastic stay at home father and he meant the world to me. He used to bring me to school. And oh, that's when you wanted to be like that. I, yeah. I would have wanted to stay at home. Yeah, exactly. I want to be like I that. I used to tell people at three years old, I want to be retired. <laughs> that was the plan. That's still the plan. I want to be retired. <laughs> the ambition is to not work. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that, I mean, that's, and that's something that I carried with me growing up. And it was, because mom and dad at home maintained such a mom and dad appearance. Galing. Um, they, That's nice. They, mom worked a high-powered corporate job. Right. For Unilever. Um, so she was constantly jet-setting. You know, we lived in London when I from one to six. And she was always in Amsterdam. She was always in Paris. Uh, you know, sometimes day trips, sometimes weekends. And yet I never really noticed her absence in the way that you know, you would assume a high powered corporate. That's parent. what a Lear jet can do, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Back then, the Concorde was running. So, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. There and back in three hours. And yeah. so I didn't, I didn't notice her absence in the sense that, like, I wouldn't describe my childhood as lacking in my mom, mother figure. She was there on weekends. Um, she constantly took us out in the time that she had. And, uh, you know, she was super mom without me knowing she was super mom. And it was only when I got older. And I developed an awareness. Of how how did that awareness come? Like, what was what was the what was the epiphany? What was the yeah? Ooh. Um, I mean, the first one is when it's, you know, her job at Singapore. I'm in the office, <laughs> and one of her office mates meets me. He playfully nudges me, and he goes, "You know, your mom's a bully." <laughs> and I was like, well, "What do you mean?" What do you mean mom's a bully? And it was, it's then that you realized, you know, being a woman in 
a corporate environment yeah. like that and having that much power uh, obviously a warrants a certain language that's used yes. for and against you but yes. b um is very very special it's it's a it's an incredibly empowering um position to be in as as a woman in the corporate sphere and that is something that i really only realized when i got older and i started seeing my friends parents and you know my sister look at employment and talk about employment and realizing that you know mom was a superstar yeah uh you know she was making it big off of not only the filipino dream but the american dream and you know she went and had kids in the u.s uh did the whole expat thing and so very successful career um for anyone and then you know doubly so because she's an asian woman yep and then so how old were you when when you realized all of this all the way from you know 14 through 18 it just slowly unraveled and like as i visited her workplace her work uh, and, then there's just, the, and then the internet's there yeah. did you did you ever google yeah. your mom all like <laughs> when i was 14 i think or 13 i was in eighth grade we were doing a project for um a research paper and one of my friends was like i'm writing a research paper on women in the workplace do you know anyone and i was like you know what my mom's a woman in the workplace yeah i wonder if she knows anything <laughs> <laughs> and you know we like we google her and my mom did an interview with INSEAD the business yeah. school and immediately you know it's what it's like to be a woman in business um and so that has existed for as long as I've known her and yet I've only ever known her as you know she buys me toys yeah <laughs> um she cooks food I know. and so it's it's something that was kept secret from me and so as I reached you know 15 16 17 18 um, I spent, I started spending so much time with my dad because my dad was gracious enough to drive me to school and to wait for my late. Uh, okay. So before you continue that story, so you're Googling mom, right? Mm -hmm. Whoa. More about mom, more about mom, more about mom. You're home. You see dad in the kitchen and you're like. Let me try dad. <laughs> did you, did yeah. did yeah. you do that? Okay. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, let me try dad. And <laughs> dad's life for the most part has been. And very, at that time you saw dad as retired, stay at home <laughs> and all that stuff. Right. So I mean, did you know who Giorgio Fresnetti was prior to this? No. I mean, to, to me, my dad um, has been my best friend for a long time. You know, we, we talk about books. We talk about uh, movies. We talk about, uh, basketball in the way that you would your best friend and he's right. never he's never treated me as separate from that and then he never told you the, uh, the, the influence he had in in corporate philippines and all yeah. that stuff so throughout all of his life and this will be said by his classmates and his workmates he's just been incredibly humble um, he is despite yeah. despite the you know record yep. of achievement and so it was when I started learning more about my mom and I started spending so much time with my dad because we'd ride in the car to school together that I started asking him questions. You know, what was your life like before me? Because all I had known was that when I was born, um, both their careers were at their you know peak at the time. Yes. And, you know, dad very graciously in the spirit of having a household with a heavy parenting president um step down well yeah. quote unquote step down or stepped away from yes. corporate life also because corporate life just kind of sucks i know um but he stepped away from corporate life and he became what i knew as my dad uh i don't know you know what was life like before me um and he started telling me stories about how you know he's valedictorian of every year uh he imagine you were him. already proud of your dad huh yeah at this point without hearing the backstory you were yeah. you were already i was i was already proud i mean to me it he was he was my superhero right know? exactly um and so i was asking him you know what was your life like and he was he was valedictorian of every year at school you know whether it was grade school high school college um he was employed at san miguel for mm -hmm. a long time and even though he dumbs it down by saying <laughs> or not dumbs it down but he he doesn't really go into detail. He just say, oh, yeah, it's 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 a very, you know, not humili humiliating but humbling experience for him because he was he was valedictorian at um, his university and then was employed as a clerk typist. So it's it's not really a job that you expect a valedictorian to have. Uh, but then, you know, he he glosses over the part where 
he got promoted so fast and he was, you know, youngest um, assistant, youngest VP, youngest right. executive, and then youngest senior VP. And he's already a global president by the time he's like 29. Correct. You know, and so having this fast track career where I'm now 23, four, you know, and I'm just like, oh shit. Of like, course, right? <laughs> like I, I don't know. I, you know, by my parents, by the time my parents were my age, you know, they were, they were taking off. Remember that story I told you about my son, right? <laughs> about the PTSD yeah. thing going, not knowing who they were was kind of, huh, okay. Knowing who they are. Yeah. All of a sudden, oh shoot. Yeah. Like, and so. So it's a double-edged yeah, sword. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. And now that I was, you know, quote unquote, an adult, really I'm like in the late teens, um, I'm finally seeing my parents reconnect with classmates they had in high school and university and with earlier workmates. And all they can say to me is, you know, your mom, your dad, they're so smart. They're so good at what they do. And Isn't that pressure? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's pressure. pride and pressure. <laughs> it's an immense amount of pride because it's like you find out your parents are just way cooler exactly. than you ever thought they were. Um, and when they're as good as what they do, like at what they do, um, it's really cool to point at my parents and be like, yeah, they're professionals yes. at this. Uh, but it's never been a source of pressure because their expectations for us, they, it's not like they're not high, but they don't have expectations in the way that a lot of parents will be like, oh, we uh, want you to be doctors, yes. we want you to be lawyers. Um, they'd always had this philosophy with us that was, and let me think on this so that I don't get it wrong the first time that it comes out of my mouth. Uh, it was always, they said to us, it's not, uh, this is my child and who do I want them to be? It was, who is this child that happens to be my child and who do they want to be? That's so... And so no matter yes. what it was, and I'm a kid that loved to switch hobbies. I loved to, you know, it was guitar, it was skateboarding. Um, you know, it was reading, it was yo-yoing. It was, it was all of these things. No matter what it was, they just said, be excellent at it. Um, and to them, because they grew up, not grew up, but built careers in HR and then in consulting, those aren't quote unquote like money making fields. Uh, but they said, be very good at what you do and the money will follow. I agree. And that's, that's the way I've sort of approached life and work and learning. Um, I'm really passionate about learning and about meeting new people, about having those discussions. And so to me, um, it's just a factor of if I'm the best at what I do, the money will come and I won't have to worry. And so there isn't really pressure in the sense that like I have to live up to my parents' careers Oh, the, so the pressure is not coming from them. Yeah. Now the pressure is coming from yourself because yeah. you want to be the best at what yeah. you do. Yeah. And, it, and not even the best in, an, in a quote unquote, if you could quantify it, objective sense. Correct. Because you can't really do no, that. You can't. But it's, it's subjective. Yeah. <laughs> and could I, can I apply myself to be better than I was at it the day there before, yeah. the year before, yeah. the six years before? And so, you know, you approach it. Um, with a sense of pride and with a sense of internal pressure. But every now and then, you know, it does loom that my parents are superstars and they were fast tracking their careers in a way that I currently am not. Um, and so if they're the blueprint, I've, I've kind of screwed up the blueprint, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm not that worried because if they can figure it out, I can figure it out. Oh yeah. Um, what about, what about the, what about a three-year-old Jason who said, I want to be like that. I want to be retired. What happened to that to that kid when he found out, oh, that's why he's retired because yeah. he had all Yeah, these. yeah. So dad retired because actually he was a, a self-made man. He was huge. You can retire when you're huge. Um, so you had that realization yeah, come to you also. Yeah, so, you know, when I got older, it was just, oh, uh, you know, there's work that you have to put in. You don't just get to be retired. You can retire when you're a major executive, but I guess, I guess I'm trying to trying to skip to the the last part. Um, right. Hey, you know uh, Stephen Covey, Covey, right? Begin with the end in mind. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the goal is to not work, and now I have to find the most creative ways to not work. Yes. But there is that old you know adage: if you do what you love, you'll never yes. work a day in your life. Amen. That's true. Um, now, 
when you found out as a teenager who mom and dad wa- were, what'd you tell your siblings? Did you reach out to them go, going, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah, actually. Very much so. And it's mostly because, you know, it comes from being the only child. Right? Exactly, right? So as much as I get bored at home, my parents get bored too. It's like you're sitting here with this 13-year-old and you're like, you, let me tell you a story. <laughs> This is going to help you. And it's something that I don't even clock until I'm like 18, 19. And I'm like, oh, that was a really good story. <laughs> um, but Well, I've marinated for five years. At yeah, least. yeah. So it's just, just ruminating back there like, huh. That had, a, that had an important moral lesson that I completely missed when I was supposed to have needed it. Um, yeah, no, but I, I went to them and I was like, did you know mom and dad were this big? And some a lot of the time the answer is no it's like i never heard this from them because you know they at the time they were raising all three of us and then right. two and then one right and so the conversations they had with me are like are them going through a life stage change you know yes. stepping away from their careers and reflecting you know it's true no oh my god they had to experience that the life yeah. change yeah. yeah so my my sisters grew up with parents that were still very much high-powered corporate people mm. and when i was coming into my own i grew up with parents that were tired people you know <laughs> that were reflective people <laughs> that were introspective people and so the, the stories that i got were completely different from uh-huh. the stories my sisters got um and so i would ask did you know mom and dad were this big you know did you know that that mom's career took off like this and you know by the time she was your age she was making this much money and Sometimes the answer would be no, you know, talk to me about it. And sometimes the answer would be a begrudging yes, and I'm not there, so leave me alone. Oh. Like, <laughs> but not not in a bad way, but more right. in in a respect of what our parents do and who they are. Yeah. And what they mean to us. Because like I said, for all of us, they were they were just mom and dad. Correct. Yeah. Now, are you in a relationship right now? No. Were you ever in a relationship? Yeah. Did you ever subliminally find yourself trying to use your mom as a template, <laughs> having having found out who she was, and and you're looking at your ex girlfriend going, uh uh-uh. uh, <laughs> no, uh, mm. um, I can't say I have honestly. My mother is <laughs> never. I mean, there there is that whole you know a son's first love is his mother. Yeah. Um, and in a way, I. I love my mom and I respect her for who she is, but I don't think I look for that in a romantic partner. I don't need someone to be my mother. No, no, to, not your mother, but more of like, like, of course the conversation gets intellectual where, yeah. so what, what oh, we, do I look for someone that's like a woman, like mom? Yes. Mom. Like, like if she's, Oh, I want to go to the parlor and um, just um, blow dry my hair. And then what? <laughs> And then probably go home and then post some pictures on Instagram. <laughs> I mean, in a way, I feel like my mom and my dad are so much of you know. It's, it's a hard bar. It's a high bar. Yeah, to, they're they're two they're two halves of one mind, really. You know. Yes. Sometimes, oh my God, yeah, that's sometimes the best description. Yeah. They split and they they express com- themselves in different ways, but, but they their, complete each other's yeah, sandwiches. You know? Yeah, like <laughs> the at their core, you know, they're the same. Yeah, and. <clears throat> by virtue of being their kid at the core i'm the same so yes. outwardly she doesn't have to be like mom in the sense that she maybe she's not a high-powered corporate woman uh who does so and so or but uh is it someone that cares about other people Ooh. is it someone that you know f- values family that values quality time that values expressing love yes and those are qualities that my parents have that they've imparted on us that I do look for in the people that I spend my time And your time mom with. and dad talk to each other a lot. A lot. It's too much. So so <laughs> if, if if you have a girlfriend, do you want this girlfriend to be on her phone or do you want your this girlfriend to be having a conversation with you over, over coffee or whatever? Or? Well, I mean, if she's on her phone while we're in the same room, clearly I'm not very interesting. Um, but... <laughs> No, I, I do enjoy that that FaceTime and the relationship yes, that yes. my parents have, you know, really demoed in my 23 years has been one that's very communicative and mm. respectful. And I remember, you know, growing up, they told me, you know, we never go to bed angry and we never go to bed without saying I love you. And that's the kind of relationship that they have. Um, and that's something that I 
look for or will want right? to achieve you mm -hmm. know, later in life. So I um, graduated from college, mm -hmm. double major. Mm -hmm. Did the pressure increase or did you, did you feel free? This episode is brought to you by Dr. Lourdes Capolong. To do what you want to do. Um, we've always been free to do what we want to do. So, uh, you know, was it more like, I'm sorry, Jason, was it more like, got you the diploma? We're good. <laughs> yeah. I'm out. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> see that would, that would have worked. That would have worked if I was employed right now, <laughs> but I am still currently searching for a job. So until I find one and I can financially support myself, I'm, I'm happy to live by their rules. <laughs> like, They've been gracious enough to let me live in their house to to use their money for food as Asian parent. A lot of Asian parents yeah. are, you know, there's no the pressure to move out isn't as great for lots of Asian cultures as it is for others. Um, and so I'm more than happy to live by those rules because of the relationship we've had. Uh, but, you know, you do feel the pressure and you feel the anxiety of, you know, I'm still unemployed and it's, you know, everyone my age looks like they're going to do work and they're finishing up things uh but also the internal pressure of you want to start giving back right. to your parents right and when that gets put on hold and you're still um you know living off of their kindness it does put a mental block in the back of your head it's like i need to get moving and you know what the the most humble statement that that i heard from that um sentence was I'm okay to live by their rules because mm -hmm. there are kids who want their cake and eat it too. Yeah. I don't have a job. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. I'm staying at your house, but I don't need to follow your rules because mm. I'll be, I'll be out soon. Yeah. But see, you, you bring that out in the open. I hope people are listening and, and watching because there are still children who actually are cognitive to that fact that, you know what, I have to humble myself while I'm trying to to develop my wings yeah. so I can fly. And I'm yeah. okay to submit to your authority. Mm -hmm. Is that is that something that mom and dad drilled down or is that something that's innately yours? Um, it's innately mine. And I can't speak for the kids who don't want to live by their parents' rules because obviously you know, the relationship that they have is clearly different enough mm. um, where they feel like they shouldn't live by the rules for whatever reason. Uh, for me personally, it comes from the fact that I respect my parents and I've always felt like they've respected me. And so living by the rules comes from a mutual understanding that it is a generosity. Um, it is a kindness that they're providing. Nice. And if I'm, if, you know, if I've, been there um if i'm living in their home then it's something that i have to appreciate and not work around but work with um to try and come to an understanding of you know when i take off you'll be there and i know right. kindness will be repaid eventually but until then oh. thank you now you've been around the world mm -hmm. what would you consider where would you consider home oh, that's a really good question um and it's one that, <coughs> sorry, is a bit contentious because my siblings and I have grown up with the term third culture kid, mm -hmm. TCK. TCK. Um, and for those of you who are you know, watching or listening that don't know what that is, it's someone who's grown up in a culture that's different from the one they were born in or the one their parents are from. Uh, and so I, my pitch to people is that I've lived my life in sixes. So I spent six years in England, six years in Singapore, six years in the Philippines, and now I'm on year four in the U.S. Uh -huh. um, so I grew up at TCK. I grew up um, absorbing different cultures that weren't necessarily mine. And so all of them feel like home in the sense that I have roots there. I connect there. Uh, but none of them could be my sole identity. Um, Are you still searching for that? No. I don't think I've, I'm searching for it so much as I've accepted that I am a multicultural kid. You know, I, I connect with people who are Indian, Chinese, um, English, Scottish, American, and being able to accept that and be part of their groups is enough for me to be sure of who I am as, you know, a global citizen and as a person. Now, um, 
having having a multicultural background is it does has it made you less judgmental has it made you more judgmental or has it made you indifferent to everything because it's stressful to actually even dip your finger i i think it's made me less judgmental especially coupled with the fact that i did study social anthropology in college so you're looking at different cultures all the time and critically uh and when you interact with people like that and you have friends like that you know you go to each other's houses you start to greet their parent like in the philippines you know we make beso yeah with, uh, titas and titas yes. and um you know you end up you know bowing in other households uh you develop a sensitivity to those practices and it's you recognize that you know our cultures aren't so different it's right. more the way we express ourselves and, and at the root of it is respect yeah and at the root of it is is a respect and an understanding of you know in a given social group this is the way we've done things correct whether it's eating food or you know greeting elders or going to school and so you just appreciate them actually when you see them things like uh you know having friends that are thai come to college you know they've mm. never been in the us and you know a custom of you know, telling everyone could we please sit with our feet behind us because it's rude to point your feet at someone that's something they appreciate and being able to connect with someone in that way over something so small but a, a cultural understanding and a shared intelligence of that um has made me really comfortable entering new spaces and being allowed to appreciate people for who they are and Correct. what they represent cancel culture okay why why is it here now and will it ever go away cancel culture um so i think cancel culture is is a bit of a hot topic on things like podcasts right because that's that's what happens you know someone says something that maybe is received the wrong way by a particular group of people um and they get called to be canceled i you can anyone out there can correct me if i'm wrong i believe it started off of a satirical like Colbert tweet mm. and an Asian woman I think her name is Sui Park I don't know um but an Asian woman tweeted you know cancel Colbert this is wrong and it was a satirical tweet obviously Colbert is not canceled yes. um and then it got used in black twitter as a joke and whatever and it's developed now into you know what is a phenomenon of people being afraid to share their ideas correct um cancel culture really stems from an earlier form of something called call out culture which began with what what kind of culture call, call out, out culture yeah. Yeah, okay. and that began um with the me too movement with Sui Park with this idea that you know we have to bring to attention when people with big platforms are sharing ideas uh, that are harmful to people whether that exists in the form of racism or misogyny or mm. whatever and i think at its core that that's a really good thing you know it's to hold people accountable um for harmful behavior and for behavior that you know we can work on to improve and to make the world more of like a slap on the hand right yeah yeah it's meant to it's meant to help people <clears throat> but that would that's what that's what it's supposed to be just a slap on the hand but mm -hmm. call that's that's what calling out is a yeah. slap on the hand but calling out um i guess we take it to cancel let's let's not slap his hand let's just kill <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think cancel culture is is scary in the sense that you know you become so, it's a form of social ostracism it's a digital right? form of social ostracism and that's what it is it's you know you say something wrong and you get checked um the underlying theory behind it being that you know it's meant meant to meant to be a learning experience right and i'm someone that believes that everyone well let's say most people can learn from mistakes if they're willing to put forth that Correct. effort uh it does exist in some spaces like for really good things like if people are constantly putting out racist content like if someone was yeah putting out racist content yeah, as filipinos so, yeah mm -hmm. you know i would i would say you know they don't deserve to have that platform like you should ban them from youtube or right. facebook or whatever right. and that's a totally valid reason for cancellation um i think a lot of people now are scared of the fact that you know social norms are constantly evolving but the internet has made it so that that evolution is on record all the time yeah. and you may have said some things that like they were okay in 2012 but in 2022 they were a little bit like what happened to kevin hart you know yeah. You're right yeah they're they were you know quote unquote okay mm. um but now they're really questionable and so 
guys like Kevin Hart, especially a lot of comedians. Because and what um what was that? Yeah, uh, Robert Downey Jr. when yes. he did uh, when he did uh, when he played uh, Tropic Thunder. When so, he yeah. did, you know, blackface. Mm. Um, those things are they were all in mainstream media because they were funny and with comedy in particular, you know, there's a certain irreverence that goes along with that. Um, do they deserve to be canceled? Maybe it depends on the severity of the action and then the intention of whoever it is. Um, canceling someone who is, you know, an outward racist and, you know, part of groups that actively speak against human rights and against, yes. and, you know, spout hate speech. That's very different from, I think, uh, canceling an actor or a podcaster that was yeah. part of a, a production that in a lot of the time is, you know, from years past. When See, that's, that's, that's the key word there. Uh, years past, it was, it was okay at the time. Mm -hmm. It's different if you're doing it now mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah, it's different. And I think most people, uh, if they're mature enough, should they own up to that? They'll acknowledge that, you know, this, mm. this was a different time in my life um you know i know better i'll do better uh and that should be enough in most cases and most of the time you know there is a sort of general acceptance of when people can see you know a, a genuine quality yeah in someone um so i do think you know it, sometimes it can be dicey but sometimes uh, it can be used for what its original intention was and it's to to make the world and the internet a, a safer and more inclusive space which is good. Yeah. It's a so good what, thing. Now, what are your, what, okay, what do you want to be? It's, it's so hard to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? You're already grown up. <laughs> so it's, it's, like, what, it's like, what do you want to be? What do I want to be? Um, I mean, as far as like literal occupations go, I don't think I have something in mind of what uh. I want to be. I want to be someone um, who impacts my community in positive ways. You know, I want to be someone that helps people. I want to be someone uh, that people remember fondly for doing a kindness or for, for helping them get through something. Um, that's what I want. And I want to be the best at what I do. Right. You know, or, you know, the best version of myself. Right. What I do. Right. Um, whatever that manifestation is, I've yet to come across. I think at 23, not a lot of people know mm -mm. what the literal manifestation of. It's stressful at yeah, your age of their quote unquote mission is yeah. their life mission. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I want to be. I mean, it's, it's, it's already stressful for a 23 year old to, to write it down mm -hmm. without superstar parents. Huh? <laughs> right. Now, I, I, I can only imagine your pressure having to write what you want to be down on paper or in your head, knowing full well that there's mom and dad who've, or who, 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 at 23 are already hitting the ground mm -hmm. running and off to the races that's that's pretty hard now with your sisters have you talked to them about your career path or is that something that you guys don't talk about um it's something that we talk about <coughs> sorry that's okay um it's something that we talk about but uh we acknowledge that you know, career paths are different. My oldest sister, she went to school for graphic design. Mm. She went to a very elite art school and then came out of that school saying, oh, I don't want to do art. <laughs> you know, I want to do business. And so she worked as a, a barista in a boba shop and is now the chief of staff for that company. And so her... See? Yeah. So her, her career path started out as, yeah, I want to be an artist. And then it has ended up as, you know, I'm attending a business school. And I'm working to be a, you know, a high powered businesswoman. Right. My second sister went to school for psych and is now pursuing a doctorate degree. And so our career paths, we've acknowledged that they're all going to be different. Um, and for the, f my older sisters, especially, you know, they happen. So spur of the moment, it's oh. like you plan vaguely, you know, what you want to be. Um, but then you just try things and you pick things up and you fall in love with them. And I think the same. It's going to be the same case for me. Um, hmm. I'm going to step into something, find out whether or not I like it, and then move from there with the hope that wanting to become better at what I do is what's going to push me into a career field. Now, you know, while you were saying that, it, it's more like all three of you are branching out into different directions, and mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think about what your mom and dad had put up, except one. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm I'm like, except one. Is it going to involve you and your sisters, or are you guys like, nah, we're not. Yeah, we don't want to be part of it. I mean, if mom and dad decides to close that, we're done. We're we'll do our thing. That's a good question. Um, I don't think any of us are dead set on inheriting it in the sense that like, you know, I must continue mom and dad's legacy as consultants and as, you know, leadership development experts. Um, but it's more in the back of our heads. It's like, except one taken, you know, philosophically for us is an amalgamation of the values that they tried to impart on us growing up. Right. Um, my mom always said that, you know, she believes in helping people win with their uniqueness. Uh, and for my dad, the namesake of the company is a J.M. Barry quote. It's the start of Peter Pan. It's all children except one grow up. Mm. And it's to do with, you know, a uniqueness and individuality and a, a winning spirit that comes from someone being unapologetically themselves in their mission and their values. Um, so that's something that even if I'm not inheriting the company would be what I carry with me to a different yes. path or company. Um so it exists in all of us, whether whether we like to acknowledge it or not. Uh, but I don't think there's any pressure to to continue it as its current form. And you know what? If if one of you actually did against your will, it defeats the the mission statement. Of, <laughs> yeah, it defeats the mission. So unless unless one of us chanced into it as like you know this yeah, exactly. is my calling. Yes. Um. But it yeah it does in a way ironically defeat the mission of except one. Mm -hmm. Now with regard to. <clears throat> This is your fourth year in the States mm -hmm. and you operate by six. What if what if you finally figure out that this is where life is going to happen? Are you going to break the pattern of six? Or are you going to continue on and make life here in the States? Uh that's a good question. I think about it all the time. Really? Yeah, because you know, all these chapters of my life are bookended by mm -hmm. locations. Um, are I, you, are you, are you OCD? <laughs> a little, a, I mean, a little bit. Oh, uh, it's going to hurt. Yeah. Like year seven, you're still yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I gotta go. I yeah, gotta, it's not perfect. I gotta go to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not perfect. So, you know, it's, you know, find somewhere quick. Right. Um, no, I, because of the fact that, you know, I lived a very luckily, very privileged, multicultural life. Um, I am very open to spending my time somewhere else, be it like New Zealand or Australia. Or somewhere so, see, you're there. still you in the travel mode, huh? Yeah. So, I, I. But what if, what if at year six, you find year, two more years of Sir George and Miss Fedora, two more years of uh, Jason being in the house? But what if on year six, you land something that you like here in the States? I mean, it's, hypothetically speaking, yeah. If hypothetically speaking, if it's if it's the start of you know what my career and my dream is, then sure, I'd stay here. You'd close that book yeah. completely and start um, this book of yeah. It's something that I still carry with me anyway. You know, I'm always right. going to be a kid who grew up multicultural, and this is just you know another chapter um, in my life. So, did you ever think about? Um, the rest of your life like i plan to are you the type of person that's why i asked a while ago if you were you were ocd i need to be married at this age i need to have the the, the number this number of kids at this age and all that stuff that's a good question um i like plans in so far as like what am i eating for breakfast tomorrow oh um, but as far as like five year ten year um no i don't do that uh and it's because Think of who Paco was 10 years ago. Are you the same person you were 10 years ago? No. Right? Um, and I think that people grossly underestimate just how much they change in a time period like that. 10 years ago, you probably, if, if I'd asked you, oh, are these your favorite bands? Is this your favorite music? You know, what tempo do you like playing at? You probably could have said a, a number of things. Amen. And you, you might have predicted you know f you know 40 50 year old me is gonna like the same things and then you get to 40 50 and you're like i don't like anything that i liked when i was 30 you you are ab you are absolutely true exactly and so maybe the idea is there like for me the vague goals that you know i want to have a career i want to say that i built something that i was part of something 
But what that is, I leave up to what current me is deciding because I'm always going to be a different person from who I was 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and accepting that you're in a constant state of evolution and change, right? change yeah. is part of, I think, um, accepting that the ride isn't going to be perfect uh, and that you are going to be a different person at the end of your experiences as when you were when you started planning them. This episode is brought to you by ABBA eServices. The ride isn't always going to be perfect. Are you a pragmatist, an optimist, or a pessimist? Um, I, I want to believe so badly that I'm a, an optimist, but I am a bit of a glass half empty type person. Um, my dad is, you know, the glass is there and there's water <laughs> in it. My dad's extremely, you know, level headed and not, not <clears throat> dumb, but just real. The glass is there and there's water in it. My mom is so optimistic that she, you know, she's the glass can be refilled. That's my mom. And so I'm a little bit, you know, my dynamic has always been, it's half empty. You know? <laughs> Why are you looking at it? It's half, and so I've always been a bit cynical and being raised with two older sisters who, um, you know, obviously never spoke to me like I was a kid. You know, you grow up like a little bit pouty sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I'm a bit of a pessimist. And part of that becomes from, you know, you're, you're scared being anxious about things like job searching, being anxious about employment and your future, that's very real. And in a way, a, a healthy amount of pessimism right. is a way to sort of alleviate. To bring it down. Mm, yeah. Like I told you. Yeah, the, the disappointment mm -hmm. almost. You're, you're sort of bracing yourself for <clears> any <throat> potential disappointment. Um, but I guess because of the way life has turned out, you know, I'd have to be a little optimistic. Right. You know, I get excited. I got excited about you know going to college, about being my own person. And wanting to be the best at what it is you do needs a healthy sense of optimism because you're under this belief that I'm capable, um, I'm prepared, or I can be prepared. And so, you know, I tell myself, no matter how pessimistic I am, like, you can do this. You've got it. Gratefulness, gratitude. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, was that something you discovered? Was that something taught to you? Uh, it was something I had to learn. Uh, do tell I feel like most kids grow up a little bit ungrateful just because like super entitled yeah, not, not necessarily entitled but you don't appreciate things for what they are until you're older and you experience a different side of things you know for example um, as a kid I really liked fortune cookies as snacks in the way that your daughter does yeah um, and you know having fortune cookies in the house was a normal thing it was like you could go to the store and you could get fortune cookies and being in countries where you couldn't like it's a small um incon inconvenience if you could call it that but it's like you know it's not the norm and you slowly miss out on opportunities and that obviously gets bigger than something like fortune cookies it's it's True. a job it's a school experience it's a trip um and so gratitude is something that you really only learn when you find out what you've been missing, you know, you begin to appreciate what's there and what you have. You see, you, do you think that it, it comes with maturity as well? Or I think so. Okay. I think it comes with a certain set of experiences. Uh, it comes with loss and with, you know, great gains. Mm. Um, and gratitude for me, because of how lucky I was to have parents that, you know, could provide the things that I wanted when I was a kid. Uh, it started when I started you know, meeting people who necessarily didn't have those things. Um, and I didn't <clears throat> look down on them. I didn't shame them for any of that, but it was more, I really love that I've been given these opportunities, right. and, uh, these experiences, and I wouldn't change them for anything. You know what? Okay. What can you share with, in summary, with kids, 13, 14, 15, who think they know it all, who think they can do no wrong? That's a really good question. Um, they're there and they're everywhere. Yeah. No, I, cause I remember so vividly what it was like to be that age. Um, I would say that, you know, 
old people, and when I say old people, it could be your parents, it could be your teachers, it could be um, whatever. They're always going to underrate you. First of all, as a 13, 14, 15 year old, you're more mature or you have the ability to be more mature than they give you credit for. True. You can be smarter than they give you credit for, but they're also not as old or as slow as you think they are. And so Ooh. it goes, it goes both ways, both ways, yeah, yeah, both ways. You can, you can be better than they give you credit for, but also they're not nearly as bad as you think. You know, the, the people that you interact with on a daily basis have at some point been young, as yeah. you said earlier, mm -hmm. um, they've been young, they've known what it's like to be in your shoes. And a lot of them have a lifetime worth of experiences that are, you know, every kind of emotional experience and story from, you know, funny to heartbreaking to extremely prideful and joyful and that's worth learning from in the same way that they can learn every bit from you about what tech what science what social advancements are happening um and my advice to you as a 13 14 15 year old is to keep an open mind to people of all kinds uh and to be in touch with who you are and what grounds you as a person and to connect with that as you move through your maturity and through your um, life stages right uh because it'll let you be a, a kinder and more helpful human being and that's I think true that's paramount to anything else that takes place in your life or your career you know, as long as you're helpful and you mean something to yourself and to others um, everything will be fine ladies and gentlemen jason rose palomar <laughs> fresneddy <laughs> Thank you.